All right, guys, welcome. I, sometimes it's always funny to say, like, good morning, good afternoon, because we have friends really from, from all over the world, and I love the fact that our, our friends, you know, I, I see a friend, uh, Pastor Hubert, Brother Hubert from Ghana. Uh, I don't know if anybody in this room has been to Ghana, uh, but it's pretty fun to see. We have Pastor Jesse from Nigeria. Uh, I saw one of our friends from Burundi. Uh, does anybody know where Burundi is? You guys ever heard of Burundi? It's in Africa. Uh, and then we have our friends from Minnesota. We have some friends from Plymouth, Minnesota on here. We've got some, uh, the Bordwicks, or one Bordwick from Wyndham, Minnesota. We've got the Sheefers, or maybe just Tom from Napanee, uh, which is northern Indiana. And then we have the Floridians. Uh, anyway, it's just an array of, uh, I just love where people can just tune in at different times. And so, one of the reasons we, we did this was uh, honestly so we could get our hearts ready for what's to come in Malawi. Uh, if this is your first time, uh, welcome. Uh, for those that are here in Richardson, right? The Linkies came to Richardson. Uh, and so we are excited that you're here. Glad that you're here. My in-laws are here uh, all the way from Florida via up to Minnesota. You guys should stay longer because I think it's still snowy up north. Um, Anyway, uh, it is just uh, an honor and a joy to do this because remember, and I, I want to do this, this might feel a little bit redundant, but we're doing a message of repentance series very simply because of a dream. Uh, last June, uh, June 27th, 2022, <laughs> uh, the Lord gave me a simple dream of seeing an African, a, a, a stadium full of Africans, and then the president of Malawi, President Lazarus Chakwera. Uh, he called the whole nation to repent. This was a dream. It wasn't long. It wasn't elaborate. It was just really simple. Uh, but because of that, by God's grace, and it really is God's grace, uh, that we have had an incredible working relationship with the local church in Malawi. Hi, Robert. Welcome. Uh, and, uh, and so because of that, we are now working with the local church. We had a, an opportunity. Rich, Rich, you remember how many pastors we got to hang out with in Malawi? Uh, well, there's the Course 7. And then I think there was 40 pastors in each of the four cities. So that's 160 pastors. <laughs> Plus, there's the thousand leaders that showed up at the last city. But I know there's a lot. <laughs> there's a lot. Oh, Tom just said 3,000. Yeah. Here's, here's what I think is so mind-blowing, is that when you walk into something that's of the Lord, uh, you can just basically get out of the way. And I would just tell you this, we've done a lot of ministry in a lot of places, internationally, nationally, locally. I've never seen anything like this in Malawi. And so because of the local church across Malawi, whether it's in Balaka or Blantyre or Lalongwe or Mazuzu, uh, or whether it's the, the local government uh, consisting of the advisor or the president, this nation is getting ready for repentance. Um, and I want to just tell you, like, it's, it's unusual to just to say it's a dream. But God can use anything. And uh, for us to get ready in June of this year, uh, when we were here, coming, coming up in June of this year, uh, we're calling four, four major cities across the, the whole country to repent in four stadiums. We've never done anything with stadiums ever. <laughs> uh, and yet our thread is going to be in prisons and farms and schools in the morning. And then in these stadiums at night, we're just calling people to repent. And we thought... You know, if you're going to call a nation to repent, we need to make sure our heart is right. And I said this last week, and I'll say it again. I'm honored that you guys came, but I, I am preparing this message for my own heart. I am preparing so that when I come into a place and I'm asking people to repent, my, my heart is in the right place. And our team is. We're taking 42 of us from America that's truly going over into uh, the warm, they call Malawi the warm heart of Africa. And when you meet them, you, you will know they're so welcoming and inviting, whether it's at the airport, whether it's through their, their government workers, or whether it's people on the side in villages. Uh, but I, I have no desire to be a hypocrite. I have no desire to say, hey, do this, and then we're not doing this. And uh, so why are we doing a message of repentance? It's not exactly a popular topic, um, and yet it feels very timely. And uh, so when you look at the series, it's in, it says lesson two. The reason it's lesson two is because last week we set the whole basis based on Acts 26, 19, and 20. So what we did is, is we did a summary to launch us into the next eight weeks, including today. And so, Kevin, if you can go there, Acts 26, 
uh, verses 19 and 20. And I want to just kind of walk you through very simply, uh, just kind of an overview. But it says this on the scriptures, therefore, King Agrippa, remember the Apostle Paul is speaking to Agrippa. And remember, Agrippa's not really a great guy. Do you remember his background? He's got some, some lineage of great-grandfather and uncle. Everybody seems to be either killing people or wanting to kill people. And so when you're coming to meet with Agrippa, Paul is saying, hey, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. That heavenly vision, remember, is the, the road to Damascus. Do you remember this? He's on his way. He's killing people. He is in hot pursuit. He's got letters in hand. He has no problem taking out people that believe in the way, followers of Jesus Christ. And so he says, look, I'm not disobedient. I'm here. Instead, I preach to those in Damascus first. And to those, and the scripture just continues on in verse 20, to Jerusalem and all the region of Judea and to the Gentiles. In other words, Paul had a message, and his message was so clear. And this is the summary that we want to get to. The first message is what? He is calling any and everybody, Gentiles and Jews, you need to repent. Now, it felt weird last week because we didn't really get into what does this look like. We just said, hey, this is his message. And so he says, hey, I need everybody to repent. And then he says, at the same time, not only do I need you to repent, I need you to turn to God. Now, remember, visually, I'm a visual guy, four kids. Laura and I have four kids. And I think the best way that you can teach people is just start walking it out in simplicity. So if you are looking at a sin of pride right here and you're staring at it and you are repentant of this sin, you have to turn from from that. Whatever that sin is, you got to turn from it. Anybody can turn anywhere. In fact, I got a haircut yesterday. It feels I feel clean today, by the way. I was talking to one of my friends at this, at this barber shop, and in this process, you can look to anywhere. You can repent from something, but the challenge is where will you look? And the challenge is that Paul says is you need to turn to God. That's the challenge. It's not to these temp- temporary fixes. It's not to these things that are just fleeting. You could love your bikes. You could love your Lamborghinis. You could love your knitting. You could love sports. You could love the masters. We love the masters. You could love March Madness. You could love all of these different things. You could love the soccer balls in your villages. But the reality is eventually it's going to go flat. And so when you repent from your pride, he says, turn to God. That's what we're after. Because remember, Scripture says he's the living God. He's the living creator of everything. And then he says, hey, by the way, when you repent and turn to God, And this is the challenge in Malawi. This is the challenge in America. This has got to be the challenge in the Bahamas. The challenge is, are we then, as Scripture says, do works worthy of repentance? So it's almost like if I could do this, I would. It's almost like when you repent and turn to God, guess what you do? You actually do something. Do works worthy of repentance. One of the things I've noticed As I have traveled for 15 years in the United States, I believe we love the call for repentance. I actually think it's not foreign to people. The challenge, though, is is will it lead to actual change in your culture? Will it lead to change in your family? Do they see something different? This is the, the Matthew 3. This is the Luke text of the fruit of repentance. Does that make sense? So in this process of, you know, repenting and turning to God, as you're turning to God, people should start experiencing the fruit that's from your life. Otherwise, maybe this is a harsh statement. I wonder, I wonder if it's genuine repentance. And so this is the theme for all of what we're saying from Malawi. Look, repent and turn to God. But guys, we want to see a change in all of these cities, in these towns, in these villages. Wouldn't that be incredible if in Richardson and Dallas we did repent, but then we would actually start seeing people share the gospel? I mean, that might rub people the wrong way because you're like, hey, I'm not called. Everybody is called to share the gospel. If you are repentant and turning to God, guess what? You have to tell people because it's in you. There's nothing that you're hiding from. And so what we're doing this series is we really ultimately want to get to this point. That's our desire. But today and for the next three weeks, we're only going to focus on this wonderful word, repent. Now, you should feel okay. I should feel okay because I've said this. I have a friend that was in Alabama, and for 30 plus weeks, he taught on repentance. And it was the same message every Sunday. And I'll say it again. Why did it take him so long to keep saying that message? He says it takes it that long for somebody to figure it out they need to repent. I don't know, Kevin, what if we started just talking about repentance for 30 plus weeks? I'd rather talk about the end times. 
I was going to say we would be in Malawi by that time. <laughs> this is your free pass, right? So here's what we want to do today, okay? In order to set the tone for repentance, I, I just really felt impressed that we need to have the... This is going to sound like, duh, Kyle, that's obvious. I really felt like we needed to have the, the tone of the Lord as our, as our foundation. Like, what role does God play in repentance? It sounds really obvious. If you're Christian, you're like, well, duh. But I actually think uh, when you go to Romans 2, there's a theme verse that we have. It's up here on your screen, but if you can put it up, Kevin, the whole thing, that would be awesome. In Romans 2, verse 4, it says this, Or do you despise the riches of his kindness, restraint and patience, not recognizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? This verse, how many of us have heard this in church? Can you raise your hand? How many of you have heard God's kindness leads you to repentance? Anybody? Okay. Okay. I don't know, maybe it's not like a, a common, but for me, whenever I hear repentance, I always hear this. God's kindness leads you to repentance. And I'm just going to tell you, I had no idea what that meant. So what I want to do is I want to just ask those that are online. I see our friends from uh, Arizona, North Dakota, Ivory Coast, uh, Richardson. Thanks for tuning in so far. It's awesome. When you guys think of God's kindness... What do, you, what do you think of? And if you're in this room, by the way, you can just raise your hand. We have a microphone. It's not to put you on the spot, but Kevin, why don't you get us started? When you, what are the, what's something that comes to your mind when you just think of God's kindness? Uh, I think kind of some of the other words that are there. He's patient with me, and in that, he shows me kindness. Uh, good. Good. Okay. What else? What else do we have? Anybody else? Just, you can't go wrong, but this is the question that we are asking Rich, what do you think of? When you think of God's kindness, what's just the first thing that comes to your mind? Um, he's really slow with getting angry at me. Huh? Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. <laughs> you know, uh, okay, when I think of the word repent in America, you know what I think of? I, we've talked about this. People holding up the signs. Say repent or you're going straight to hell. That's kind of what I think of. Trust me, if you go to any major city, give it time. I love what Rachel Cunningham, she just says, God's kindness is that he doesn't give me what I deserve. I think that's a great, great definition, Rachel. Anybody else in this room bold enough to try a shot at something? What would you say? His love. Yes. Hey, that's pretty awesome, Betty. Ghana, Hubert, Brother Hubert from Ghana wrote God's love at the same time he just shared it. Uh, that's pretty cool. Lots of great examples. Salvation that I don't deserve. Jess Newsom wrote Jesus' sacrifices, his kindness. Here, here's what I would say. God's kindness. You ready for a definition? I want you to write this down, and you're going to get really mad at me. Uh, I'm just going to give you a list of words. It's his goodness. It's his mercy. It's his pity. It's his love. It's his grace. It's his favor. It's his compassion. It's his goodness. It's his tenderness. It's all of these words. And in fact, in Scripture, I know there's different Hebrew words, and I know there's different Greek words, but the reality is they're intertwined. And so when you try to describe kindness, it's kind of like, I, I feel like it's a yes. Right? Like, okay, Laura, do you have your microphone? When you think of somebody showing you kindness, how would you describe that? Just somebody, not God, but just a person. Uh, like, what do they do? Yeah, it's just something. When you think of kindness, what, what comes to your mind just about a human doing this? I uh, picture someone stopping by my house and um, encouraging me or just showing kindness, like dropping off some a plate of cookies. Okay, so Something you... Something really sweet. You just went from somebody showing up <laughs> yeah. to giving you cookies to something sweet. My point is, is that it can be described and enwrapped in so much. Does that make sense? So when God's kindness... I, I like that, by the way, the cookie part. Uh, and so here, here's what I want to just say is, is that I am going to attempt to show you how God shows you his kindness in order for us to understand repentance. If his kindness leads to repentance, we should probably know what his kindness means. Does that make sense? And yet it's so hard to describe. It's so hard to understand what is he talking about. Now remember, in Romans 2, let's begin to unpack this. Um, and before I do, I want to just give an illustration here. Uh, I was on a phone call. We were on a prayer call this morning as our team. And we were starting off in our prayer. The next thing you know, Laura opens up our door. She goes, hey, by the way, it smells like fire in our laundry room. So I quickly just left the prayer call. 
and I didn't even need to leave. I smelled the fire. Our laundry machine, right, our dryer, somewhere, somehow, something caught on fire. And, I, you know, my first thought was, oh, why did I let it get this long? You guys ever had lint that's ever built up in a dryer? If you live in the United States, you have an electrical, right, a dryer, and when your clothes get dried, the lint comes off, and it comes into this little trap, or it comes into the hose in the back, right? Well, right away, we pulled it up, and there was just some burnt lint on there. And you want to talk about an illustration. The Lord's like, you don't even need to preach. I'm going to show you real life. Uh, for me, like, we've had this dryer for eight-plus years, at least, right, Laura? 15, thank you. Mm -hmm. that, that even proves my point even worse. Uh, 15 years. I'm not, go ahead. I do clean the lint every time we do a load, but it's the deep stuff yes. that gets in there yeah, that you can't reach. There's this <laughs> obvious stuff, you pull it off, but then it goes down deeper. And I knew, because we have our friend Sylvan, he told us even this year, he goes, hey, you should probably clean this out. And you're like, yeah. Anybody ever done the, yeah? You guys, I'm telling you, it's the same mentality with repentance. You know what we should be doing. We know what we should be doing. And yet the reality is, is down there when I took a screwdriver and some other long things that went really far down there, I just started pulling out stuff from years. And I just kept thinking, if this keeps happening, a fire is coming. We are going to talk about the illustration in Scripture that just says, if you do not repent, the day of wrath is coming. And by the way, the day of wrath, there's no question about it. It's fire. The day of wrath that's coming to those that do not know the Lord, it's fire. And so for me, the Lord's like, oh, look, I just spared you today. I could have had this whole thing on fire, but my kindness decided to show you, you still have a second chance. Clean it. And then here's the craziest thing. God showed me kindness when Sylvan was here and said, clean it. And he kept telling me, you know what the reality is? I wonder if I'm going to go back and clean it again today. Does that make sense? Well, I might get busy. And I might start hanging out with my family. I might start doing some things. And then, Kevin, you know what happens? Don't do it. Yeah, thanks. And I think that's what's happened, you guys, in the area of repentance in our life. And Paul is writing about this. And he's warning the Jewish people. He's warning those that say, hey, I know the Lord. He's saying, do not wait or the day of wrath is coming. And yet, in all of this, God, God's kindness just delays the process. When you look at Romans 2, verse 1, it says this, Therefore, any one of you who judges is without excuse. For when you judge another, you condemn yourself, since you, the judge, do the same things. Now, remember, you've heard this in Scripture. You've heard this in teachings. Whenever there's a therefore, Wendy, why is it therefore? You ask what it's there for, and right before, okay, right before Romans 2, hang on here for a second, is Romans 1, and verse 29 and on. And Kevin, if you'll go there, this is important. So therefore, Romans 1, verse 29, okay, the scripture is going to allude to this. It says, they are filled with all unrighteousness, evil, greed, and wickedness. They are full of envy, murder, quarrels, deceit, and malice. They are, and it continues on, they are gossips, and then it keeps going on. They are slanders. They are God-haters, arrogant, proud, boastful, inventors. That's an interesting one. Inventors of evil. And then this one's so bizarre. Disobedient to parents. Praise, I mean, not praise God, but like the point is, is all of this is like not good. Keeps going, Kevin, if you would, if you don't mind. Undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, and unmerciful. And so what you're going to say is in Romans 1, remember in Romans 1, 16, the gospel is to go to the Jews and the Gentiles, right? Salvation for all, to the Jew first and to the Gentiles. But then in all of Romans 1, what you begin to see is that there's the unrighteousness of all mankind. And as you unpack at the end of Romans 1, you begin to see the lifestyle of Gentiles, of people that are not living for the Lord. And it says, although they know him, in verse 32, they know full well God's just sentence, that those who practice such things deserve to die. They not only do them, but scripture then just says, they even applaud others who practice them. And so it's like, they're okay living in this clogged up world of uh, Lent. They're okay with it. And in fact, it's me saying, I had a clogged dryer and I'm okay with it. Robert, you should have one. Lauren, don't worry about cleaning your lint dryer. Keep going. Like, that's what they're doing with sin. 
And I'm just going to tell you this. It's happening in the United States everywhere. We are applauding sin like it's normal now. And yet, interesting enough, that's the world. Because in, in Romans 2, here you have the Gentiles that says, hey, but any, if anybody who's judging without, uh, is, excuse me, verse 1, it says, therefore, any one of you who judges is without excuse. For when you judge another, you condemn yourself, since you, the judge, do the same things. You know what they're thinking? Hey, we're free from that. We're in the religious world. That's not us anymore. Do you see the, the, die cast, you see the, the contrast here? You have this group that's okay with it, but then you have this group that says, hey, we're good. We don't do any of that. In fact, verse 2, we know that God's judgment on those who do such things is based on the truth. Do you really think any one of you who judges those who do such things yet do the same that you will escape God's judgment? In other words, they're both guilty. I want to just slow down. Kevin, is this, are you tracking? Yeah, I'm here. I think, Rich, if you were to articulate these two different audiences, does anything come to your mind between the Romans 1 and Romans 2? Um, I mean, I think they're just overlooking what, they're, what they are walking in, their own um, unrighteousness, their own sin. But they're turning and pointing. It's kind of like take the plank out of your own eye before you look at the speck in your brother's eye. Yeah. I think, uh, Rich, to your point, if you go to Matthew 7, verse 1, Matthew 7, verse 1, the scripture is pretty clear as what Rich is alluding to here. In verse 1, it says, do not judge so that you won't be judged. For with the judgment you use, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. And this is where Rich went. Why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but don't notice the log in your own eye? So you have these two worlds, the, the unrighteous, and yet you have the... Uh, and then in, verse, in chapter 2, you have the people that are functioning in self-righteousness. Kevin. Just a second. I think it's uh, a contrast between, they, they think it's not seen, right. between that that's really obvious, but in reality, there's no difference. That's right. I want to keep going here. We're going to really unpack this, but I just I, I feel like it's important to understand Romans 1 to jump into Romans 2. Now watch this, where this goes. Remember, the, the Jews would have applauded. I love what Warren Wiersbe says. He says the Jews would have applauded Paul's condemnation of Gentiles. They would have been like, yes, great, look at you. They're all in this sinful pattern. The Jewish national and religious pride encouraged them to despise the Gentile dogs. Do you, do you remember there's this big contrast? And he says, and they have nothing to do with them. And yet Paul used this judgmental attitude to prove guilt of the Jews. What they were guilty of. What they were saying, they're guilty themselves. And they thought they were free from judgment. Ready for this? Because they were God's chosen people. Because of a label, because of their father being Abraham, they're exempt for some reason. And Paul begins to understand and explain this is not, this is not the case. I think this is crazy. Uh, when you look at verse 4, or do you despise the riches of his kindness, restraint and patience, not recognizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? Kevin, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go to Numbers 14. Okay, hang on. I, this is where, if you're in seminary, we are literally going to, um, we're going to give you a fire hose today. In Numbers 14, 20 through 23, here, here's what I want you to see. In Numbers 14, 20 through 23, there's 10, 10 times, watch this. It says this, I have, and, and the Lord responded, I've pardoned them as you have requested. Keep going, Kevin. Yet as surely as I live and as the whole earth is filled with the Lord's glory, it says this, none of the men who have seen my glory and the signs I performed in Egypt and in the wilderness and have tested me these 10 times and did not obey me will ever see the land I swore to give their fathers. None of them who despise me will see it. Now, in 24 and on, it describes Joshua and Caleb, right, who then get to see it. But it says 10 times, 10 times. What are the 10 times that these individuals, Israelites, tested the Lord and did not obey him? This is essential to understand God's kindness. 
Remember, he's talking to the Jewish people. Does this make sense? If he's talking to the Jewish people and he says, hey, look, here's the deal. You despise the riches of his kindness, restraint and patience. God's kindness, so that as God keeps showing us his kindness, it should lead to, to repentance. Number one, okay, I want you to start writing these down, okay? I'm going to use my little cheat sheet here. Uh, and this list by no means is from me. Is number one, okay, they were lacking faith. Kevin, if you'll go to Exodus 14, 11 and 12, lacking faith before the crossing of the Red Sea. Okay, in Exodus 14, I don't know if I'm going to write all of this out. We'll see for a little bit. In Exodus 14, verses 11 and 12, they said to Moses, it is, is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you took us to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Isn't this what we told you in Egypt? Leave us alone so that we may serve the Egyptians. It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. So their first complaint, one of the first times, right, was what? They don't really want to go. Remember, their back is up against the wall. They're not really believing they can cross the Red Sea, even though they complained. Kevin, go to Exodus 14, verse 21. Even though they complained, I want to show you something, God's kindness. Exodus 14, verse 21 and 22, the scripture says, And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. The Lord drove the sea back with a powerful east wind all that night and turned the sea into dry land. So the waters were divided, and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with the waters like a wall to them on their right and on their left. And so what do you have? You have the Lord showing his, his kindness, even though they didn't have the faith. That make sense? Like, why would you bring us here? They're about to kill us. I want you to show us something. Remember this. In Numbers, it says 10 times, 10 times the Israelites couldn't figure this thing out. I want to give you another example. Kevin, if you go to Exodus 15, verse 25, I'm going to shorten how I'm writing things. Uh, do you remember the bitter water at Mara? You guys remember that? Exodus 15. 24, I'm convinced that when you understand God's kindness, we will begin to understand repentance. In Exodus 15, verse 24, Kevin. Exodus 15, verse 24, if you'll go there first. It says, the people grumbled to, Mos uh, to Moses. Hey, what are we going to drink? It's kind of like your kid saying, I'm tired of leftovers. <laughs> right? I need something new. There's a complaint. So he cried out to the Lord Moses and showed him a tree. When he took this tree, he threw it into the water, and the water became drinkable. But what was the issue? They were tired. They didn't know what they were going to drink, right? But now, watch. When you go to Exodus uh, 15, verse 25, well, there you have it. He responded. Uh, he responded. I should have just kept it there, so thanks, Kevin. So in this, even though they complained, he gave them water that was drinkable. So they crossed here, right? He gave them water here. And I can guarantee you every time the Lord's like, are you, are you done whining? Are you done complaining? Okay, numbers back to Numbers 14. Remember this 10 times. Number three, do you remember the desert of sin? Remember there's more complaining. Kevin, if you'll go to Exodus 16, verse 3. And you can say, man, this is a long list that I'm counting. You're only on number three. Here's what I am convinced of. God does this in our lives all the time. He shows up time and time again. And we don't recognize his kindness in our life. In Exodus 16, verse 3, the Israelites said, If only we had died by the Lord's hand in the land of Egypt when we sat by pots of meat and then we ate all of the bread we wanted. Instead, you brought us into this wilderness to make this whole assembly die of hunger. Do you remember? Anybody remember what they were doing in Egypt? Yeah, they're slaves, and they're saying we have pots. We'd rather have pots of food over there, and this is their complaint. And yet, because of God's kindness, in Exodus 16, verse 4, then the Lord said to Moses, I'm going to rain bread down. I'm going to rain bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. This way I'll test them to see whether or not they'll follow my instructions. So you know what God did? Even though they complained, God did what? His kindness revealed bread. Over and over. You would think, can I just say this? That after they complained and then they got the water, do you think they should probably fall on their knees? 
and say, God, forgive us. Do you think for our sake they should go to the yellow chair and say, you know what, God? I'm sorry for complaining that we don't have any food. Thank you for giving us bread. You see, God's kindness should draw us to him because he's giving out his goodness. He's giving out his faithfulness. He's pouring out his love. He's pouring out his compassion. His mercy should lead us to repentance and say, God, I'm not worthy of this. That's why Paul writes about this in Romans 2. Because you see what we're seeing here is he says, look, guys, God kept showing you time and time again. I'm present in your life. And yet they came and played the same game. Well, I'm lacking faith. I'm complaining. I'm complaining. It goes into a number four here. Do you guys remember? It says in Exodus 16, 20. Do you remember where they were even disobedient when they collected the manna when they weren't supposed to? Collecting manna. Kevin, you remember when we did, when we did revive school? What was the thing that we kept talking about the Israelites all throughout the Old Testament? All the laws and just, they didn't get it. They didn't get it. Every time they didn't get it, he still showed up. In Exodus 16, verse 20, it says, but they didn't listen to Moses. Some people left part of it until the morning and it bred worms and smelled. Do you remember they weren't supposed to pick up a certain amount of, uh, of this? And yet they still were disobedient. And then therefore Moses was angry with them. I don't even know how Moses did it. But by God's grace, in Exodus 16, verse 31, even though they picked up stuff in disobedience, in Exodus 16, verse 31, the scripture just it's pretty, pretty simple. It says, uh, the house of Israel named the substance manna. It resembled coriander seed, which was white and tasted like wafers made with honey. And Moses said, this is what the Lord, this is so bizarre to me. This is what the Lord has commanded. Two quarts of it are to be preserved throughout your generation so that they may see the bread I fed you in the wilderness when I brought you out of the land of Egypt. Rich, do you remember what was the purpose of these two containers? Rich, do you remember that? Sorry, I'm mashing buttons. I'm sorry, what containers? I was working on an issue back here. I apologize. Kevin, you want to jump in? Yeah, I'll jump in. It's, it was so they would remember what God had provided for them. You have two jars, and where were the jars, Kevin? They were to be put in the Ark of the Covenant. So in the Ark of the Covenant, like the Holy of Holies, right? This is the place where we had multiple things. The rod, right? That blossomed the almonds, right? Remember this? Remember all of these different aspects. One of the aspects that was in the Holy of Holies was two quarts of manna so that God would kept saying, do you remember what I kept doing even though you kept complaining? And, Kevin. And the unique part about that was... If they collected too much, we just talked about it, they collected too much, it would spoil, but they were to keep this as a remembrance, and it wouldn't spoil. And so they collected manna. They weren't supposed to, and God just said, but I'm going to have, it's almost a, a, I'll just put a memory for this, so that you would recognize my kindness despite you guys not listening. God's kindness should lead to repentance. When you come into the Holy of Holies and you see those two jars, those two quarts of coriander seed, those two jars of, of manna that have never gone bad, can you imagine experiencing no mold on any of that food? It's the forever leftovers. It doesn't go bad. That's God's kindness. And I see this text and I know it seems a little bit extreme, but I'm telling you guys, he's trying to speak into the Jews and saying, guys, you have despised God's kindness in your life, and your generations have done this. Number five. Uh, I'll just say this because I'm going to save time. Number five is, is that in Exodus 16, they did the same thing. <laughs> they collected more manna. They attempted to collect manna on, I'll just put this, on Sabbath. That's where I'll put this one. You guys remember that? They weren't supposed to collect anything. So they collected more on, uh, when they shouldn't, and then they collected some on, even into, on the Sabbath. And I'll, I'll write that up here, Exodus 16, uh, 27 and 29. You know, as I, as I write these out, one of my things I want to 
encourage you guys with is, what if you wrote your page of God's kindness? What if you wrote five examples in your life? You know, what has that caused you to do? Scripture says, when you experience God's kindness in your life, He's showing you what it says in Romans 2, his kindness, his restraint, and his patience because he wants you to be drawn to him. Just what if that's the purpose of God's kindness? To draw you to say, man, it's not me, it's him. When you go to number 6 in Exodus 17, 2 and 3, when you go to... uh, Again, you guys remember this? We're going to keep going back to this. The lack of water again. Uh, And then this is at Rephidim. R-E-P-H-I-D-I-M. And that comes from Exodus 17, Kevin, verses 2 and 3. Exodus 17, so the people complained to Moses, give us water to drink. It's almost like we just read this, did we not? Different story, by the way, and different place. Why are you complaining to me, Moses replied. Why are you testing the Lord? But the people thirsted for water and grumbled against Moses. And they said, why did you ever bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? In Exodus 17, 5, 6, and 7, God's kindness showed up again. Again. The Lord answered to Moses, go on ahead of the people. I wonder what his tone was. Was there a big sigh? (sighs) Go on ahead of the people and take some of the elders of Israel. Take the staff you struck the Nile with you in your hand and go. And and he says, I'm going to stand there in front of you on the rock at Oreb. And when you hit the rock, the water will come out of it and the people will drink. And Moses did this in the sight of the elders of Israel. God's kindness showed up again. When we're talking about repentance, remember, repent, turn to God, do works worthy of repentance I actually believe the essential core of understanding repentance is God showing you his love, his mercy, his compassion, his kindness, his goodness, his gentleness. It's all of the above. Otherwise, repentance doesn't exist. Anybody have any thoughts? I'm just supposed to pause for a second. Yeah, Wendy, Laura, you want to hand the mic to Wendy? I was just doing a study recently, and something that struck me was when they made the golden calf because they were tired of waiting for Moses to come down, and Aaron did it. He collected all the jewelry and formed this calf for them to worship and all this revelry and debauchery, and the next morning there was manna on the ground. That I'd never strung those two things together, but... Wow, that's God's kindness. It's like you knew my seventh point. (laughs) The Lord said, just ask. And I think that's an incredible example. It's here you have the Israelites, and they turned to something other than God. They created the golden calf, and exactly what Wendy just said, in the middle of all of this, they still gave them manna. Kevin, if you'll even go here to Exodus uh, 32, verse 14, Here's what's even crazier. If they make a golden calf out of the earrings and the rings and everything, you guys remember all this? You know, you would think that God would just say, I'm done with you. And in verse 14, it said, the Lord relented concerning the disaster that he was going to bring on his people. He relented the disaster. God's kindness spared the idiots. He spared the people that forgot everything. That everything God had done brought them through. All of these lists, you guys. Everything that he did to show up, they forgot it again. And yet God relented bringing disaster on these people. God's kindness keeps showing up to the Israelites. You guys, it's all a prophetic picture of what Christ is going to do. All of this. It's a God's kindness saying, I'm going to show you. I want to be patient because I don't want you to perish. Number eight, you're going to see it again. Thanks for sharing that, Wendy. Uh, I'll just write this up here. Exodus, so you have it, just a reference. 32, 7 through 10. Uh, Number eight, what you have here is is that they're complaining. Uh, At, uh, Kevin, you can go to Numbers 11, 1 and 2. There's a lot of complaining at Tabarah. 
Now the people began complaining openly before the Lord about hardship. When the Lord heard this, his anger burned and fire from the Lord blazed among them and consumed the outskirts of the camp. Then the people cried out to Moses, prayed to the Lord and the fire died down. In other words, God brought the fire because they complained. And so I'm going to put it on the fringes of your dryer and I'm going to show you it's real, but I'm not going to burn it down. That's God's kindness. That has nothing to do with me. It's totally God's kindness. In 11 to Kyle, that it, they cried out to Moses. Yeah. They, they, don't, they still don't recognize yeah. that it's God. It's like they go to the middleman. I'll hold my thoughts on all that. You don't have to go to any middleman, by the way, to pray. You can go directly to the Lord. And that's important to understand. Kevin, they didn't understand that yet. They saw him as the vocal voice. But the reality is, is that, you know, like, hey, what do we do? Moses, you're the guy. You figure this out. Okay, two more. And I think this is important. Uh, and by the way, that comes from Numbers 11, uh, 1 and 2. We have two more. You guys are doing awesome. Number nine. Oh, what do you know? Anybody want to guess what they do? They're complaining. And this time, not just over uh, drinks, but lack of food. Again, Numbers 11, verse 4. Here we go again. Then the people, uh, if you go again, sorry. Uh, contemit whoa. Cont Robert, how do you say that first word? Contempt contemptible. I feel like we should all say that. Contemptible, <laughs> right? These people, these contemptible people, <laughs> Uh, among them had a strong craving for other food. In other words, I'm tired of eating pizza every night. I'm tired of eating ramen noodles every day. Like, let's make it practical here, right? I'm tired of the same food. The Israelites cried again and said, who will feed us this meat? <laughs> Poor guys. Numbers 11, verse 9. God's kindness, you guys. Here we go again. When the dew fell on the camp at night, the manna would fall with it. Moses heard the people, uh, family after family, crying. Uh, uh, we'll just stop there. You can stay in verse 9. So even though they complained, guess what God did? He brought the, the dew, and what was with the dew? The manna. In God's kindness, he overlooked their complaining. But don't you think they should say, God, I'm sorry. Forgive me. We don't. I want to go to one more, and then we're going to radically turn a corner here. You can see how, how all of this builds. Thanks for participating. Number 10 is that they are failing to trust God uh, and, oops, and enter the promised land. Kevin, if you'll go to Numbers 14, uh, one, four, 1 through 4. Because we've had 10 examples, time and time and time again. Numbers 14, verse 1, Then the whole community broke into loud cries, and the people wept that night. All the Israelites complained about Moses and Aaron. <laughs> and the whole community told them, If we only had died in the land of Egypt, if only we had died in this wilderness, only, uh, the scripture says, Then why is the Lord bringing us into this land to die by the sword? So now they're concerned about being killed a different way. Our wives and our little children, they're going to become plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? So they said to one another, let's appoint a leader and let's pack it up and let's go back to Egypt. <laughs> Are you guys tired of me going through this list? <laughs> it's the same battle we have now. You have a list of of descriptions, of lacking faith, bitter water, we want more food, I'm complaining this isn't good enough, and you start going through this list, and then yet for me as I began to read this, and I honestly, I, I know we, we joke about this chair, but when you begin to sit down and ask the Lord, how have you showed me kindness, and I haven't recognized and turned back to you, time and time again. 
God has spared us. In Malawi, I'll never forget this. We were in a community called Blantyre. 1,000 pastors were meeting in a room, in a church. And a pastor stood up and he said, Malawians, if we don't recognize that God is calling us to repent now, we will miss our window of God pouring out his favor. It was an Israelite saying, guys, we got to learn from our past. Otherwise, more destruction is coming. Does that make sense? There's this window of time that I really believe, a window of time that I really believe that God is pouring out over a nation, over a country, over a city, over a town, over a village. And I believe it's God's kindness that's sparing us from his wrath pouring it out now. I will never forget when we did Revive Texas. I really believe that God gave a window over this period of time over Dallas-Fort Worth. And I wonder sometimes, did we miss it? But by God's grace and God's kindness, he gives us another chance. And I think in our lives, each one of us, if you think you missed it one time, God's saying, it's okay, come to me again. Does that make sense? If you need hope in your life that you've missed it, join the club. God's kindness is so patient. Kevin, it's what you said. It's restraining. God's kindness is pouring this out. And this is what I love about this. It says that we are given another chance. But yet what Paul says is in verse 5 to the Israelites, to the Jews, but because of your hardness and unrepentant, I'm back in Romans 2 verse 5, but because of your hardness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourselves in the day of wrath when God's judgment is revealed. In other words, guys, he has given you so many chances, you're missing it now. Well, what if that was a message to America? What if that was a message to Nigeria or the Bahamas or to India? Hey, guys, you're not repentant. And because of that, the day of wrath is coming. Now, that's not really encouraging. That's not really uplifting. And yet, for me, um, Paul uses God's kindness and examples to tell the Jews right in front of his face, guys, why are you hardening your hearts and not repenting? Because let's just face it, if we do not repent at some point, if you are not a believer and you do not repent, the day of wrath is coming. And the scripture is pretty clear in verse 6. He will repay each one according to his works. By the way, that's a great white throne. This is not a salvation issue if you're a believer. He's saying, I'm going to judge you based on your works if you're lost. If you're lost and you have not repented, yes, you will experience the fire. That's the reality. And he's saying this to the chosen people. Guys, I need you to turn to Yeshua. He says in verse 7, Eternal life to those who by persistence in doing good seek glory, honor, and immortality. Verse 8, But wrath and indignation to those who are self-seeking and disobey the truth, but are obeying unrighteousness. Affliction and distress for every human being who does evil, first to the Jew and also to the Greek. But glory, honor, and peace for everybody who does what is good, first to the Jew and also to the Greek. And in verse 11, it says, there is no favoritism with God. I know we read through this a lot pretty fast, but I want to just make sure it's clear. Like, if you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, wrath is coming. At some point, God's wrath is going to be released. In which we talked about this yesterday. It's almost like a, the scripture says in 2 Peter 3, it's like a thief in the night. It's like the time. You guys, what's that hourglass that we talk about? Rich, you guys have that? Don't you have something like this for us? I don't know if you guys have that. Yeah. Like at some point, God's kindness is going to stop. At some point, when he comes back, God's kindness is done. And he's telling us right now in 2 Peter, Kevin, can you go to 2 Peter 3? At some point, that sand's going to stop. In 2 Peter 3, I think it's 2 Peter 3. Is that right? I think it is. 2 Peter 3, we'll go there and we'll find out. Lord, I trust you. Yeah, 2 Peter 3 verse, uh, Kevin, why don't you start with verse 3? 2 Peter 3 verse 3. 
write this down because this is how all this ties in. First, be aware of the scoffers will come in the last days to scoff, living according to their own desires, saying, where is this promise of his coming? In other words, yeah, right, like it's really going to happen. Like there's really a day of wrath coming. Like really the Messiah is coming. Ever since the fathers fell asleep and all things continue as they have been since the beginning of creation. It says on in verse, uh, continues in verse 5, they willfully ignore this. Long ago, the heavens and the earth were brought about from water and through water by the word of God. Through these waters, the world of that that time perished when it was flooded. By the present heavens and earth are held in store for fire by the same word, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. Dear friends, don't let this one thing escape you. With the Lord, one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like one day. The Lord does not delay his promise. As some understand delay, but is patient with you, (laughs) not wanting anyone to perish, but all to come to repentance. Okay, did you catch that? God's patience is still there. God's kindness is still there. But eventually, it says in verse 10, eventually it keeps going and you need to understand this. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. On that day, the heavens will pass away with a loud noise. The elements will burn and be dissolved in the earth and the works on it will be disclosed. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, it is clear what sort of people you should be in holy conduct and godliness as you wait for and earnestly desire the coming of the day of God. The heavens will be on fire and be dissolved because of it, and the elements will melt within with the heat. But based on his promise, we wait for the new heavens and new earth where righteousness will dwell. We can't play games any longer. At some point, his kindness is going to run out. But his kindness is being displayed because he doesn't want anybody to perish. But let me just say this. People will perish if we do not repent and turn to the Lord, Jesus Christ as our Savior. Kevin, does that, are, are we on the same page? Is this clear? Yeah, I think... Again, it kind of goes back to last week when we were talking about our perceptions of repentance. We often start there. In reality, we have to look at God's kindness because that's what's leading us to repentance. And God's kindness is expressed by him sparing us despite our inadequacies. I just I want to slow down for that. I, got, I just feel like that's really important. Uh, in Exodus, Kevin, verse 30, chapter 34, verse 6. Exodus 34, verse 6. You know, we have this image of God in the Old Testament, right? That he's going to just crush you and kill you. <laughs> like he's just that kind of God. That is true. He does do that. But there's another side that says in Exodus 34, verse 6, And the Lord passed in front of him and proclaimed, Yahweh, Yahweh is a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and rich in faithful love and truth. Maintaining faithful love to a thousand generations, forgiving wrongdoing, rebellion, and sin, but he will not, and then it just continues on, leave the guilty unpunished. So you see this? Do you see how it already unpacks? Like he wants to be slow to anger. He wants to be patient with us. But there is a judgment that is coming. There is a judgment that is coming if we do not repent. Now in... uh, In Hosea 10, if you'll go there, Kevin, uh, this is going to be really drastic. But I think this is like an 11th example. And it's the worst one I can find. In uh, in Hosea 10, Kevin, specifically, if you go to verse 9, if you don't mind. Hosea 10, verse 9. And those that are online, thanks for running with us. Uh, those that are in the room, thanks for hanging in here. I, look, I have no problem saying repentance is not like this, hey, that, was, that felt great today. It says in Hosea 10, 9, I'm going to read through this to 15, and then I'm going to come back. Israel, you have sinned since the days of Gibeah. Israel, remember, this is the minor prophet Hosea. Okay, Hosea is getting ready. Kevin, do you remember this context? He's getting ready to tell them basically about Assyria. The, be the northern kingdom of Israel Good. was getting to be taken in the scattered. Yep. So the northern kingdoms or the northern tribes 
are going to be overtaken by what's called Assyria. Okay, some of you might have heard that, some of you might not have heard of it. And he's telling them, hey, by the way, it's coming. Okay, so this is the context. And he says, Israel, you've sinned since the days of Gibeah. Now, hit a pause, go to Judges 19. Okay, remember, fire hose, we're going to keep throwing stuff at you with this. So hang in here. This is probably the worst example that I can find. Judges 19, uh, you can just go to Judges 19. I don't know why this keeps falling. Judges 19, verse 1. Uh, you can just go there as a reference, Kevin. I'm just going to tell the story. In Judges 19, do you remember there was a Levite guy from Ephraim? And this Levite, he acquired a woman from Bethlehem. She ends up becoming a concubine. This concubine then eventually says, I'm done with this Levite. So this concubine says, I'm going to go back to my dad's house in Bethlehem. So as this concubine goes back to Bethlehem, right, she spends months there. And then the next thing you know, uh, the, the husband, the Levite, he wants his concubine back. Now, Kevin, what's a Levite? Just so we're all on the same page. Levite would have been the tribe that was designated to be priests or priestly duties. This is the guys that were taking care of the Holy of Holies environment, right? The, the whole temple, right? This is the mentality that they are doing this. So he goes back to look for his concubine. He finds her. And he takes his two donkeys, by the way. He stays then, he finds her, and then in that process, she's already stayed there, and he stays at the father-in-law's house, quote-unquote, for three days. And then on the fourth day, the father-in-law's like, you know what, to the Levite and to the concubine, I think you need to stay longer. I think you should stay longer. So they have some more drinks, they start eating, and then they begin to enjoy another night. And then on the fifth day, the father-in-law says, I need you to stay again. And this Levite, the guy who's supposed to have these priestly duties, he's like, you know, I think I need to leave. So this Levite takes the concubine. As he takes the concubine, right, they begin to go back to Gibeah. The town that we're referencing here in Hosea 10. And they go back to Gibeah, and Gibeah is in Benjamin. Kevin, what's Benjamin? The, the youngest yeah. brother tribe. One of the tribes. Okay, is everybody with me? So you've got a husband, a Levite, a concubine. Those two don't really go together. They're going to Gibeah in Benjamin, and they don't have a place to stay. So he goes to the city square. That's where all the leaders would stay, right? So this Levite hangs out in the city square, and an old man comes up to him and basically just says, hey, what's going on? He said, well, I don't have a place to stay. He says, you know what? You come with me. And he comes into this house, and I don't know how to describe this, except that it's going to be really graphic. As he comes into this house, a bunch of perverted men surround the house. And they surround the house and they say, hey, what? Guess what? We want that man, the Levite, to come out because all of these men are saying, we want to have sexual relations with that man. Okay, this is, the, this is awful. There's nothing good about this story, by the way. And so all of these men, they want the Levite to come out. And the old man says, no, 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 you can't have the Levite. You can have my daughter who's a virgin. It's getting worse. They said, no, 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 we don't, we don't want that. In verse 25 of Judges 19, they seize the concubine. Judges 19, 25, but the men would not listen to them. So the men seized his concubine, took her outside to them. They raped her and abused her all night until morning. And at daybreak, they let her go. The... The concubine couldn't even function. It was so bad. Verse 26, it says, A woman made her way back as it was getting light. And she collapsed at the doorway of the man's house where her master was, the old man and the Levite. And when the master got up in the morning, he opened the doors. He went out to leave on his journey, and there was the woman. His concubine collapsed in the doorway of the house with her hands on the threshold. And he says, get up, let's go. There's no response. So the man put his concubine on the donkey, and then they, they decided to go try to go home. I don't understand the story. I'm not even going to describe, attempt to tell you what this means, but it says this. I, I do know what it means. It's just horrible. It says, when he entered his house, he picked up a knife of an unresponsive concubine. He took a hold of his concubine and he cut her up into 12 pieces, limb by limb. And then he sent her throughout the territory of Israel. And so he sent a warning of 12 tribes. Kevin, they ended up getting what? 12 tribes got what? Piece of a woman. They got a piece of a woman. And this took place where? In Benjamin. 
It was a warning. And everybody who saw it said, nothing like this has ever happened or has been seen since the day the Israelites came out to the land of Egypt. To this day, think it over, discuss it, and speak up. How many think about this little phrase when we think about this story? I want you to think it over. A woman who has been killed, cut up into 12 pieces, discuss what has just happened, and then speak it up. Speak about it. Nobody wants to talk about this story. And please understand this. By no means am I trying to be anything dis disrespectful of people that have gone through this. People that have been raped. People that have been uh, over and over. People that have had to go through so many different scenarios. This is no disrespect. I'm just reading a scripture text. Because the scripture says we're supposed to think about it, discuss it, and then speak about it. This is the story. And by the way then, when it gets to Judges 20, I think this is important. Verse 3. The Israelites were tired of this scenario. and So then they decided to turn against each other. So as this sinning was taking place, right, when the Benjamites allowed this to happen, in verse 3, they just said, hey, what, what in the world? How did this happen? And so then in verse 11, it says, Israel decides to go against the Benjamites. And Kevin, all of a sudden, we have what? We have a fight between who? It's basically a civil war. We have a civil war, a civil war because of this horrific sinning. Now, that's the story. Go back to Hosea 10, verse 9. Now this is the context of that story. You, lead, you read one word. Of Hosea 10, verse 9, it says, Israel, you have sinned since the days of Gibeah. Like, can you think of anything worse? You have been sinning since that took place. Does that make sense? Since that horrific thing that you got mad, you're still sinning. And this is what he says. They've taken their stand there. Will not war against the unjust overtake them in Gibeah? I will discipline them at my discretion. Nations will be gathered against them to put them in bondage for their two crimes. Ephraim, you used to be a well-trained calf that loves to thresh. But I'll place a yoke on her fine neck. I'll harness Ephraim. Judah will plow. Jacob will do the final plowing. And now he says in verse 12, uh, an Old Testament reference, you guys, of what we're talking about in repentance. So righteousness for yourselves and reap faithful love. Break up your unplowed ground. It is time. Just put a little insert to stop with this ongoing sin. Stop it. You're my people and yet you're not doing. You, since that horrific time, it's getting worse. He says, break up your unplowed ground. It's time to seek the Lord until he comes and sends righteousness on you like the rain. He gives you, in verse 12, a, a moment in time. He says, I want to show you my kindness. But in verse 13, he says, I'm done. My kindness, my patience, it's done. You've plowed wickedness and reaped injustice. You've eaten the fruit of lies because you've trusted in your own way and in your large number of soldiers. The roar of battle will come against, will rise against your people. And all the fortifications will be demolished in a day of war. Kevin, this is the Assyrians. This is what we're talking about. Like Shaman's destruction of Beth Arbel, mothers will be dashed to pieces along with their children. So it will be done to you, Bethel. Because of your extreme evil at dawn, the king of Israel will be totally destroyed. Since Gibeah, the sinning did not stop. And he says in verse 13, here's why. And this is how I want to close today. Thanks for hanging in here on this longer time. But I want to say this. This is important. Go to verse, uh, Hosea 10, Kevin, verse 13. And this is what I want us to understand. This is what I want us to process and pray through. And just say, hey, and this comes from a guy named David Vanneker. I want you to just say, what am I doing? One, what did they do in verse 13? They sowed iniquity and reaped injustice. In other words, in Galatians 6, 7, and 8, we sow what we, we reap. Why is the church in America not growing according to the population? I think it answer speaks for itself. You realize that? We're one of the only countries in the world that Christianity is not growing according to the population. Number two, do we eat the fruit of lies? 
Do we eat the fruit of lies? Verse 13. Are we believing in something that's against the word of God? This is what was happening to the Israelites, right? They were sowing iniquity and reaping injustice. They're eating the fruit of lies. And then the final one is just this. And I think this might ring a little bit more close to home. Are we trusting in your uh, own ways, according to verse 13, and strength? All these come from Hosea 10, verse 13. So he gives the illustration of Gibeah, and then he just says, hey, look, here's the deal. This is what we are doing. This is how we are giving into this. If we do these things, verses 14 and on just says war is going to come. Mothers and children will be crushed. Every defense would be destroyed and rulers would be cut off. That's what happened to the Israelites. And I think for me, um, I'm so thankful that when you go to the, in verse 15, back, Kevin, into Romans 2, it says, they show the work of the law that's written on their hearts. Their consciences confirm this. Their competing thoughts will either accuse or excuse them. <laughs> Through our repentance, we, either, we will either actually be excused and be set free, or we will be accused. Does that make sense? We will either be excused, or we will be accused. Kevin, you want to define that? One's like a hall pass. The other one's like standing in front of the judge and pointing out what's wrong. Yeah. God's kindness is giving us an option, all of us, right now. First and foremost, to the lost. Please, turn to my son, Jesus Christ, who died was buried and came back to life so that all of our sins could be literally pardoned. That's the first type of repentance for the lost, for the believers. I actually really believe it's a gut check today. Are we allowing any of these things to creep into our lives? Are we allowing any of these things? Because if that's the case, I would just say this. Like, let's just sit down and ask the Lord. I'm 100% guilty of not slowing down and asking the Lord for clarity. What am I doing and am I recognizing God's kindness in my life? The Israelites over and over and over had a hard time with this. And I would just say if we can, can we just, just for a couple minutes, can we just pray? I know we're online here and I know people are there, but I just, I think it's important that we can just, I don't know, let the Holy Spirit speak to you today. Uh, it's pretty drastic, but God's kindness allows us to come to him. And so as we're online and in this place, let's just quiet ourselves and talk to the Lord.
verse for us as we're just here in this place. Uh, Hebrews 10, 26 and 27. It says, For if we deliberately sin after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of a fire about to consume the adversaries. Once you have received the knowledge of truth, the knowledge of Christ, and we continue to deliberately function in a lifestyle of sin, the scripture just says there is no point in Jesus dying for us. That's why we shouldn't applaud lifestyles that promote sin. That's the reality. There's no point then in what Christ has done. And every one of us, we have to ask ourselves, is there a place that we're functioning in sin willingly and obediently into that sin lifestyle? Because if that's the case, we are totally rejecting what Christ has done on the cross. You can say, well, that's it's not real positive. I just think in 1 Corinthians it says we need a wake-up call. The church needs a wake-up call. The lost needs a wake-up call. And here's what I love about this whole thing. God's kindness is still giving us a chance. God's kindness right now in each one of us that's listening right now, as we're listening to this, please understand this, in Romans 8, verse 2. In Romans 8, verse 2, the words of Paul, he says this. He says, because the Spirit's law of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. God's kindness is being extended right now to every one of us. Turn to Christ. Turn to Christ. And I really believe this. And I saw a question on there. I'm not sure I caught everything here for this. But let me just say this. As the church, we, yes, as believers, need to function in a lifestyle of repentance. As we function in a lifestyle of repentance, we can only pray that that would carry over into the lost. That as we function in repentance, the lost would then be drawn to Christ. And as they're drawn to Christ, guess what? Then maybe our nation would radically turn to him. In Malawi, we've asked the president to call the whole nation to repent. Does it take a president to call the nation to repent? It could, or it could take the church. But either way, we are still obligated to come to the Lord and understand his kindness and look to him in repentance. And so, Lord, we just say thanks. Thanks for this word uh, that we can go to in Romans 2. Thanks for the examples of the Israelites that we saw over and over again. Even though they went to this, this, this life of sin, God, you kept being patient with them. You don't desire for any of them to perish. But yet, God, we see at some point, at some point, it's going to stop. And I pray that everybody that's listening doesn't wait until it's too late. I pray that we would repent and turn to God in this moment today. Jesus is the answer. And we thank you for that. In your name we pray. Amen. Uh, those that were online, thanks for joining us. Uh, it went long, but thanks for hanging in there. Those that are in person, thanks for being here. And uh, we'll be back next week. And it's going to come specifically, just so you know. Uh, and I, I have to tell you, I'm, I'm excited because it comes from Matthew 4, where Jesus says, repent because the kingdom of heaven has come near. And so we'll continue our theme of repentance next week, same time. Bless you all.